Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this keynote lecture. Uh, my name is Maria Loureiro, and I'm at the University of Santiago de Compostela, and also I'm a member of the recently created Research Center ECOVAS. I have the pleasure to step in in representation of the scientific committee of the ERI 26 conference, in particular, in representation of my colleagues Anne Sophie Kripping and Klaus Eisenach. The three of us have served with honor as a um, scientific committee for this conference. All of you know that we have to be very careful with the timing. We have until five o'clock, so we have to respect the time limit. And in order not to use any of, my, any of your time, let me just introduce you with great pleasure and honor our speaker today. Next, please. So we have the honor today to have with us Professor Joseph Stiglitz. He's a an American economist, as you know, working at Columbia University. He's also the co-chair of the high-level expert group of the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD, and the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute, a recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economic Science in 2001, and the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979. He is a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank, and a former member and a chairman of the US President's Council of Economic Advisors. In 2001, he won the Nobel Prize for Economics, joined with Michael Spence and George Akerlof for laying the foundations for the theory of markets and asymmetric information. In 2011, Stiglitz was named by the Time Magazine as one of the, one of the 100 most influential people in the world. He is the author of numerous books and several bestsellers. His most recent titles include People, Power and Profits, Rewriting the Rules of the European Economy, Globalization and Its Discontents Revisited, The Euro and, their right, the, and Rewriting the Rules of the American Economy. So thank you so much, Professor Stiglitz, for being with us today. It's an honor and a pleasure. And without any further ado, please, next slide, please. Let me tell you that <clears throat> Professor Stiglitz will be presenting today a keynote <clears throat> based on this paper that you see in your screen. <clears throat> the, the title of the paper is The Social Cost of Carbon, Risk Distribution, Market Failures, an Alternative Approach. You can download it at the MBR Working Paper Series if you haven't done so. It's an excellent reading. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you, Professor Stiglitz, and the floor and the screen is yours. We see you in a moment, so please feel free to write your questions in the Q&A menu. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I wish I could be there in person. Um, the reason the social cost of carbon uh, is so important is that prices help guide allocation of resources. And if we don't get the social cost of uh, carbon uh, correct, we won't uh, allocate resources uh, in connection with climate change appropriately. If we have too low of a social cost of carbon, then we won't do enough to mitigate, uh, to, to reduce the emissions. And uh, conceivably, if it were too high, we would do too much. And so uh, that is the reason why the, the issue of the social cost of carbon has become uh, such a critical issue. Uh, among President Biden's first, first acts as President of the United States was uh, an executive order asking to revisit uh, the uh, uh, social cost of carbon. Uh, the social cost of carbon that had been used under the Trump administration had been very low. Uh, the uh, Trump administration really didn't want to do anything about climate change and and that was part of the reason why uh they chose that it was clear that that was inappropriate and so uh this paper was written in part to provide some guidance uh, of how to think about uh the uh, uh choice of the social cost uh, of carbon um we were concerned when we wrote the paper uh, that if 
the Biden administration went back to the social cost of carbon that have been used in the Obama administration based on uh, the integrated assessment models that were popular at that time, uh, that uh, the uh, social cost of carbon that would be adopted would be too low, better than that of Trump, but not sufficient to achieve the kinds of goals that were set in Paris, uh, not uh, sufficient to uh, get us on uh, the path to carbon neutrality by 2050. In the tentative uh, uh, preliminary uh, social cost of carbon that was adopted by the Biden administration, uh, our fears were realized. Uh, they uh, adopted a number temporarily that was uh, much better than that of the Obama administration, let alone to say that of the Trump administration, but uh, we believe it was uh, far too low. So uh, we've been trying to continue trying to uh, articulate why was the model, the integrated uh, assessment models that were used partially as a basis of that estimate wrong. Uh, our concern is that they did not adequately deal with issues like risk distribution. The basic underlying normative framework was uh, badly flawed. Uh, and so most of my talk today will be about that. I also want to go on and talk a little bit about uh, uh, some of the implications uh, of taking on board the kinds of concerns that I uh, uh, talk about in the first part of the talk, uh, what are the implications for optimal policy uh, responses? So I wanna go back, next slide please, to the uh, insights from one of the, the, the first IPCC report that had a uh, chapter on uh, uh, economics and economic implications. Uh, I, I was one of the lead authors of that uh, 1995 uh, report, which uh, helped push the agenda of climate change. Next slide. Uh, it emphasized the unique characteristics of the climate change problem. Uh, the large uncertainties, both scientific and uh, economic, uh, the uh, importance of nonlinearities and reversibilities, climate tipping points, which we've come uh, to appreciate even more in the quarter century since that report, the uh, asymmetric uh, distribu distributive impacts uh, both geographically, temporally, uh, and uh, in terms of the income distribution. Uh, another aspect that's very important uh, is the very long time horizon that makes some of the tools that we may have used for short run cost benefit analysis uh, particularly inappropriate. And finally, uh, the global nature of the problem. Next slide. So, well, subsequently, uh, many of the concerns that we raised uh, have uh, moved uh, front and center. And in particular, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, we began to talk about uh, at the point there wasn't uh, uh, sufficient evidence to uh, put as much emphasis as we would today, is that the most devastating effects of climate change are not associated with the change from of, of one degree, one and a half degrees, two degrees, two and a half degrees. Uh, if that were all that were at stake, we could accommodate that. But they are associated with uh, the many uh, multiple dimensions, uh, changing sea, uh, sea levels, but most importantly, uh, impacts on weather variability and extreme events floods, hurricanes, droughts, fires, frost. And uh, these can also have large health and, and uh, very large economic uh, consequences. Uh, one way of understanding that is to think of there being a uh, probability distribution of temperatures and small changes in average temperatures uh, 
can give rise to significant increases in the probability of and severity of extreme events. Uh, these ex uh, extreme events, for instance, in the United States, uh, we've lost in one year alone, one and a half percent of GDP in extreme weather related events. Uh, and so uh, that just gives you a feeling for how significant uh, the consequences uh, can be. Well, uh, next slide. Um, the uh, one of the uh, concerns is how do we design the optimal response? I'm not sure that's the right way of, of framing it, uh, but uh, the natural economic model is to balance the benefits and the cost. And uh, at the time that the, these issues were first being discussed, there was a concern about doing too much. Uh, and if we did too much, uh, we would be sacrificing too much. And uh, the uh, integrated assessment models, which made an important contribution of bringing together economics and environment, uh, the standard IAM models, I'll, uh, uh, I'll refer to those, uh, there are a whole set of them, very, very different kinds. I, I say no, no, it's a good thing to integrate economics and environment. The question is how you do it. And uh, the models that are particularly uh, influential in the United States, uh, less so in Europe, uh, are those where, uh, I'll describe them in a minute, are not so much uh, focused on the processes or on the uh, intermediate targets. They're, they're uh, 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 a intertemporal optimization problem I'll describe in a second. But those models, uh, the advocates point out, suggest that the optimum entails three and a half degrees or more, three and a half to four degrees centigrade. Um, that is markedly different from the view of the vast, vast majority of the scientific community, which has argued that going beyond two degrees represents uh, unacceptable risk. And in fact, a recent IPCC report pointed out that just going from one and a half to two degrees increase the risk enormously in a nonlinear way. And you can imagine then going from two to three and a half degrees centigrade, how much that increases risk. And so there is now a divide between the vast majority of climate scientists who say, we have to limit it to one and a half degrees or possibly two, but nothing beyond that. And the IAM models that some economists have pushed would say, don't do anything that goes beyond three and a half degrees. Uh, the major thrust of my talk today is to say the economists who are putting this uh, view forward are wrong and the scientific community uh, is uh, almost surely correct. Uh, now, uh, those models saying that you uh, shouldn't go be, uh, shouldn't do anything to limit it to anything less than three, three and a half degrees, of course, are going to get a very low social cost of carbon. And so that's the point. The social cost of carbon that was used by the uh, Obama administration correspond to these models where, that have unacceptable increases in climate. And if you had a more reasonable models generating more reasonable restrictions in the increase in climate, you would get a much higher social cost of carbon. So the thrust of my talk uh, 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 this afternoon is going to be to try to explain why did the models go so wrong? Where were there very special assumptions? The next slide. Well, uh, part of the, the, the uh, the, the point here is that uh, there are numerous deficiencies in the models related to uh, assumptions. Uh, and um, the, the 
the consequence, I think, is dangerous because it's uh, uh, giving fuel, fuel to, to the climate skeptics who want not to do uh, very much. Um, the uh, critique of the critique that I'm going to put forward is that there are large economic consequences of not doing anything uh, and not doing enough, especially uh, uh, associated with the very large risk. Uh, GDP, which is at the core of these models, is not a good measure of well-being and uh, doesn't take into account uh, broader aspects of environmental degradation and health and lives. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And uh, much of the discussion talking about giving up GDP uh, is, is thus a, a false trade-off. Um, the IAA models uh, have overestimated the cost and underestimated the benefits uh, and the IAM models have an inappropriate normative framework, especially with respect to handling risk and uncertainty and uh, the distributive effects, both intergenerational and intergenerational. Uh, next slide. So let me just talk about uh, what the standard IAM model are. All of you know it. This is just a, I'll, I'll try to do it a, a very quick review. Uh, it involves an intertemporal maximization problem involving a representative agent, um, which introduces an environmental variable into the production function and uh, uh, a worsening of the environmental variable uh, shifts the production function down. Uh, typically, there's no account of the destruction of the capital stock. Uh, the climate change itself, the environment variable, state variable is affected by fossil fuel usage. Curbing fossil fuel usage uh, reduces the GDP today, and that uh, poses the key intertemporal trade off that the models focus on uh, the trade off between lowering GDP today and higher GDP tomorrow. And the standard IAM model then attempts to find the optimal solution. And that's where uh, the uh, conclusion that I mentioned before of three and a half uh, degrees. Next slide. Uh, just to show this formally, uh, it involves maximizing social welfare function, which is an integral of utility, discounted utility with a production function where output can be used for either consumption, investment, or, or uh, environmental uh, uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation of, of carbon emissions. Next slide. And uh, the standard evolution of the environment related to emissions and uh, the evolution of the capital stock related to investment. Next slide. And then the standard pro, uh, uh, solution involves create, uh, uh, writing down a Hamiltonian that uh, describes uh, at each moment of time, as it were, the uh, uh, something, uh, uh, the sum of utility plus uh, um, the uh, uh, a variable reflecting the evolution of uh, uh, capital and uh, the environmental state variable with a shadow price associated with each. And uh, this is where the social cost of carbon comes in. Uh, PE is the shadow price associated with the evolution of uh, uh, the state variable carbon. And we normally uh, divide that by the margin utility of uh, consumption at, the, uh, at any date to get the social cost of carbon uh, at each date. Next slide. Well, there are, of course, uh, any, you know, any model uh, results depend on what you put into the model. And um, all models involve simplification. So the fact that it's simplified is not a self a, a criticism. The question is which simplifications and uh, 
what assumptions go into the model that obviously shape bias. No, I, I, I use the word bias very strongly, bias the results uh, very strongly to lead to conclusions that uh, uh, we should accept a higher uh, level of climate change and use have a lower value of the social cost of carbon. And uh, as people have looked at the models, uh, a change, for instance, the mo one of the important things, the damage function, how, uh, what happens as uh, uh, climate change occurs to GDP, to uh, lives, to health, uh, there's a concern that uh, the models have an Im as an input uh, embraced uh, enough, uh, uh, a, enough nonlinearity in the cost function. Remember at the very beginning, I talked about how the uh, uh, cost to our economy have been very related to extreme weather events. Those are changes in the probabilities associated with the tails of the probability distribution. And those can change very uh, nonlinear way with small changes in uh, the, the degree of, of uh, average uh, temperature. So uh, one of the things that has become clear, especially in uh, the last decade, is that the results of the, the earlier models were not robust. Uh, as one uh, incorporated more realistic damage functions, uh, the results changed in some cases quite dramatically. So uh, many climate scientists uh, criticize the model for not incorporating uh, the most recent advances in climate science. Uh, economists criticize it for not incorporating advances in economics and finance. Um, for instance, uh, importances of uh, nonlinearities, uh, non-convexities uh, in both the climate model and the economic model. Uh, hysteresis effects, uh, uh, irreversibilities, and uh, all of these, of course, can give rise to large systemic effects and large systemic fragility of the kind that we saw in 2008, uh, where uh, uh, actually uh, a, a seemingly little part of the global economy, uh, namely uh, subprime mortgages in the United States led to the loss of trillions of dollars of GDP uh, and showing uh, the importance of uh, the, uh, the complexity uh, uh, in the economic system, things that were not at all captured in the standard representative agent model. Uh, in that case, it didn't incorporate environment. But since the IAM models are based off the same kind of model, economic model, it's clear not including these kinds of nonlinearities, non-convexities, means that the analyses of the IAM models were as or even more flawed as uh, the flaws in the macroeconomic models that underestimated the cost of uh, not addressing the risks uh, in the financial sector. Uh, and that just highlights the point I made before, that climate change can increase disproportionately with greenhouse gas concentrations, and the damage can increase disproportionately with climate change. Uh, and uh, the importance of the uh, possibility of large destruction of wealth. Next slide. One of the problems with most of these standard models is that they have too narrow a view of what we should include in damages. Uh, this relates, of course, to the work that I did as uh, that was referred to in the beginning uh, as uh, chair of the International Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress, which uh, uh, provided a strong critique of the use of uh, GDP or uh, material uh, production as a metric of uh, well-being. Uh, it standard approach doesn't put uh, a reasonable assessment of the value of life or impacts and uh, 
health. And uh, uh, here I just talk about how uh, a slight variation uh, of the analysis of a fraction V of the population loses their lives every year because of climate change and the value of life is M times per capita income expected loss on this account alone is M times V. Uh, reasonable estimates of this imply high values for the social cost of carbon alone just from this effect, which has been left out of most of the standard IAM models. And this is just one example of the many important costs that have been ignored. Uh, another important one is uh, biodiversity and uh, uh, the Dasgupta report that just came out uh, in the UK illustrates the importance of, uh, the economic importance of biodiversity. Uh, next slide. Well, uh, what I've talked about so far is really focused on, you might say, the environmental aspects of the integrated assessment models. But uh, I'm going to spend most of the time today talking about uh, the flaws in terms of the analysis of markets. Uh, the uh, IA mo models build off of the standard representative agent intertemporal maximization models. Uh, for instance, ignore a host of market failures and some important restrictions on government. Uh, the fact, the underlying premise of the model is that, but for the environmental market failure, the uh, environmental externality, the market would be efficient. Uh, but in fact, much of my work and much of the work of the last 40 years uh, has shown that there are pervasive market failures. Uh, I focused a lot in my work on imperfections of information, asymmetries of information, absence of risk markets, uh, other work. Uh, uh, recent years has focused on imperfections of competition. Uh, there's a host of uh, market failures. One important aspect I'll come to in a second is uh, all of these are related to a market failure in innovation and innovation is key to addressing the problems of climate change. So um, the implication of assuming that markets are perfect is that if we optimally correct the distortion through say a carbon tax the economy will be efficient that's absolutely wrong and it results in a, a misguided focus on a carbon tax as the solution and i'll come to that in the second part of my talk next slide um the the Market inter imperfections interact and climate change entails aspects of all. Uh, so uh, I've emphasized uh, already that I think uh, the importance of uh, risk associated with climate change. Uh, there's also aspects of imperfect information. We don't know uh, uh, how fast climate change, we don't know exactly uh, the nature of the impact, and we don't know how it's going to affect uh, each unit in our economy, firms and households. So just to uh, recall uh, the result uh, uh, with uh, my, uh, the theorem with Bruce Greenwald is that economies with imperfect risk markets and imperfect information, asymmetric information, are never constrained prey to efficient. So there's always an important role for government intervention. And um, one of the implications uh, of that line of research is that intervention should not be limited to simple price intervention. One application that was very important was that of my uh, 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 classmate at MIT, Marty Weissman, uh, who pointed out that in the absence of risk markets, uh, quantity uh, regulations may be superior to price, uh, and I'll come back to that issue in the second part of my talk. Uh, one of the implications also of imperfect information is that capital market imperfections are pervasive. Uh, 
and uh, can lead to underinvestment in certain key areas, including uh, R&D to mitigate the consequences of climate change. And, uh, um, and these capital market imperfections are like, especially likely to be important in investments in areas where price signals are not working well, such as climate change. Um, and one of the things that we've seen very relevant to the nature of climate change that I emphasized in the very beginning, climate is a long run issues and capital markets, ion firms tend to be short sighted, uh, partly as a result of problems of corporate governance. And I unfortunately won't have time to get into that. Well, the point of all of this is that once one takes into account all these market imperfections, which the standard IA models ignore, um, the cost of reducing emissions may be much smaller than that estimated in those models. And that means in turn that uh, we can do, uh, uh, it is optimal, desirable to uh, curb climate change much more than those models would have said. Next slide. Um, the um, models also uh, can be seen in another way uh, that uh, they assume uh, that if there were market failures, government could have corrected them and has done that. Of course, the fact is that it hasn't. And there's a second thing when it comes to distribution that uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later about intertemporal distribution across generations. And uh, those models implicitly assume that the government has optimally redistributed income across generations, which of course is not the case. And that is why one cannot read off of market rates of interest uh, anything about the uh, 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 intertemporal uh, evaluation of different uh, generations. Um, and uh, actually, it turns out that if there are costs of redistribution across generations, then uh, even if the government redistributed optimally uh, subject to those constraints, uh, you can't read off uh, from market rates of interest uh, what the appropriate uh, intertemporal margin rate of substitution across generations. Well, one way um, of embedding this in the formal model that I gave earlier is to say that there are some constraints imposed on the government, which I re represent here by, by a capital gamma, and a shadow price associated with that constraint. And uh, you can then go forward and analyze the optimal uh, intertemporal utility maximization problem, but now subject to a set of constraints that the standard models have ignored. The importance of doing that is that it changes the social cost of carbon, not assuming that there are no constraints, the shadow price of constraint is zero, obviously it has important implications for the what the uh, social cost of carbon will be. Next slide. Um, one example of this is that uh, uh, it underestimates the role that government can play in stimulating innovation for climate change. So, uh, if the market had already done the optimal innovation, then uh, to try to encourage more innovation to reduce carbon emissions, uh, it itself introduces a distortion and uh, as an economic cost. But if you begin with the results of most of the research in innovation economics of the last 50 years, uh, they have said, parallel to the results in the economics information, after all, R&D is a kind of information, there is no presumption that markets on their own are efficient in the rate and direction of innovation. To the contrary, the presumption is that markets are not efficient. Um, 
we've seen an enormous reduction in the cost of renewable energy in recent years, even with limited government encouragement. And it would be even stronger with stronger government policies. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, important points, I won't have time to develop it, is that that kind of innovation would actually have broader benefits to the economy. So again, what we get at the result is that the particular assumptions that used uh, overestimate the cost of achieving carbon reductions and underestimate uh, the benefits. Next slide. I want, now want to turn to one of the main uh, themes of this talk is the, the inadequate treatment of risk. And climate change is associated, as I said before, with a huge amount of risk. Uh, typically, uh, what is done is uh, to do Monte Carlo. Uh, uh, they focus on a central case and then do a lot of uh, uh, experiment around that central case, but that is not the appropriate way of uh, dealing with risk. Individuals are risk averse and willing to pay, to pay a lot to avoid risk. There's a second thing that's also missing from the standard models, and that is uh, a uh, risk analysis that takes into account the correlation between the social margin utility of income and uh, the nature of the uh, environmental risk itself. So the fact that the social margin utility of income will be high in those states of nature where climate change and its adverse consequences are large implies that uh, uh, the uh, uh, cost of climate change is even larger than uh, it would be uh, if uh, uh, that were not true. Um, so large losses and back stakes combined with risk aversion mean taking strong action now is far more desirable than it would be in the absence of risk. And that in turn means the effective discount rate uh, uh, should be lower uh, and I'll actually, so, so some argument may even be negative. Uh, risk aversion itself would induce stronger action, uh, but even more so once we take into account the correlation with the margin of social utility. Uh, so next slide. Well, uh, so far what I've done is work within the standard uh, utility framework uh, and uh, trying to argue that working within that framework, but doing it correctly uh, uh, would lead to a much higher margin of social co cost of carbon, a much more uh, aggressive attitude towards climate change. But actually there are uh, several concerns about the normative framework itself. Um, and uh, that's because the standard model, one of the important parts is the standard model assumes that there is an infinitely lived individual or a sequence of individuals, uh, but there is optimal intertemporal redistribution across them. So you have a dynastic utility model. The alternative framework is to say, no, uh, what we are doing is adding the utility of different generations, a sequence of generations, adding them up. And um, typically that's done with a discount rate, but uh, Ramsey, the first person who formulated this kind of model, argued that delta should not be uh, positive, uh, that you should actually use a delta of zero. You should not discriminate against future generations. Now that leads to some mathematical problems that uh, growth uh, theorists have uh, dealt with, but I'll, and I'll put those uh, to the side. The thing that I wanna emphasize is that if you don't optimally engage, engage in optimal intergenerational transfers, then the marginal rate of substitution between uh, uh, one generation and the next has nothing to do with the market rate of interest. And uh, to look at that market rate of interest uh, as uh, the guidance of uh, discounting is wrong. Next slide. 
So that brings me to discounting. Uh, uh, it is obviously a key to policy. How do we evaluate the benefits of reducing carbon emissions, most of which are going to occur in the future? If we use a, a high rate like was used under the Trump administration, 7%, we're basically uh, uh, not putting much value on anything that helps happens uh, 50 years now. So essentially nothing that happens to our children, grandchildren, let alone grand, great-grandchildren matters. Um, so uh, the implicitly, the IAA models, the standard ones, use a very high discount rate. Uh, the Obama administrations, when they adapted the IAA model for the social cost of carbon, used a 3% discount rate. And I'm going to try to explain why I think that is grossly too large. Next. Well, uh, as I said, the, the standard problem was that these models uh, assume that there is a, a, a government optimally intertemporal uh, 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 engages in optimal intertemporal redistribution, and so that the margin rate of substitution across generations is the rate of interest. Uh, but that that there there is no reason for uh, believing that to be the case. And uh, if we used a, a, a more reasonable approach where we look at, make an assumption about uh, the elasticity of margin utility, and make a forecast of, of the rates of growth of per capita income, um, uh, if you look therefore more directly at what is the marginal rate of substitution, you can't justify a discount rate greater than 1.5% ignoring risk. That's the riskless rate. Next slide. But once we introduce risk, we get a much lower rate. Um, so the standard approach conf confuses risk discounting with time uh, discounting. Uh, those are two different uh, constructs and there are appropriate ways uh, of uh, doing it. Um, and, but the the uh, standard way, of course, uh, looks to uh, risky investments uh, where we uh, often uh, discount at a higher rate. But of course, the nature of the problem I've just described with climate change is that we're trying to mitigate those risks. We're buying insurance against those risks. And once we recognize that, what we come, the conclusion we come to is that we ought to use a discount rate that is lower, and I would argue significantly lower than the safe discount rate. That is to say, you, we want to use a rate significantly lower than 1.5%. In the 1995 IPCC report, I wrote a chapter, a paper with Ken Arrow and a couple of other co-authors where we uh, uh, established that. And uh, uh, it was partly uh, the basis of uh, my argument to the US government when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors that we ought to use a rate that was significantly lower than 1.5%. Next slide. Well, um, there are some further deficiencies in the normative approach. I, I can't go all into all of them here, but it, uh, as Marty Weitzman emphasized, it ignores the consequences of fat tail distributions. And in fact, of course, the expected utility isn't even defined. Uh, and uh, as we have a fat tail distribution, it uh, implies a very high social cost of carbon. Um, there's much else that's left out of the model, for instance, endogenous and changing preferences and technology, which actually is very hard to incorporate uh, into their uh, uh, approach. Next uh, slide. But there is a, a somewhat deeper question I want, uh, that arises in general discussions of decision making, and that is the following, that we don't have uh, really a complete ordering, um, that uh, because we don't know 
we really don't know about all the future contingencies. We can't really provide a complete ordering of all those contingencies. And that in turn implies the optimization approach, which is fundamental to the IAM. That whole optimization approach is questionable. Um, and getting a complete ordering is even more difficult in the context of making social decisions where you have the arrow uh, paradox. Um, the point is that even though we can't get these complete ordering, we may be able to get a consensus uh, among society. And that actually is what the international community has done. What they've done is an alternative approach and where they said, there are bounds beyond which the world faces unacceptable risk and that we can at a reasonably low cost avoid those extreme risks. If we can, we ought to do it. And that's what we're trying to do by limiting climate change to one and a half to two degrees. And if that is the case, what the economic analysis ought to focus on is to define the optimal paths consistent with achieving those agreed upon goals. And that gives rise to what is sometimes called the process-based IAMs, where you maximize social welfare subject to the constraint of achieving either the goals or even the uh, intermediate target of carbon neutrality by uh, 2050. Next slide. Well, uh, by now, uh, you've heard me say this uh, uh, several times already, so I won't repeat it again. The consequences of these model failures are very serious. It, reckon, the, it results in a failure to recognize the urgency and the scope of what has uh, to be done, and it leads to a reliance on simplistic instruments in particular, an overemphasis on uh, price intervention. Next slide. So that brings me to uh, the key, what I view as the key policy, uh, policy issue. For an economist, the, it begins to, to what extent do we want to rely on price interventions? Uh, one of the questions I'm not gonna be able to talk about is if there is a price intervention, what should be the level and time profile of prices? There's some important trade-offs. Uh, and uh, the other question I will talk about very briefly is whether the policy should be pursued. Next slide. So uh, what I'm going to describe now is based on uh, two pieces of work. One is a paper of mine that appeared in the European Economic Review called Carbon Pricing is Necessary but Insufficient and uh, Addressing Climate Change Through Price and Non-Price Interventions. And next slide. And the second thing is the report of the uh, high level commission on carbon prices that Nick Stern and I co-chaired uh, uh, with the uh, support of the uh, World Bank. Uh, next slide. And uh, that carbon uh, pricing commission was, was uh, precisely to assess the kind of policy issues that I described uh, in the very beginning of this section. Next slide. Uh, the, the conclusion of that commission was very strong. Carbon pricing is necessary, but insufficient. You needed large public and private investments, need for regulations to guide the economy and stimulate innovation. And the, the larger, we, the better we succeeded with the public and private investments, better our regulatory framework, the lower the carbon price uh, that is required to achieve the Paris goals. Next slide. Um, the, in terms of the level of carbon pricing to give a guidance to get towards the kind of goals the international community has agreed on, our conclusion was you need uh, prices that are substantially higher than the social cost of carbon, say of the Obama administration, but still uh, at a level that would not be uh, highly disruptive uh, to the economy. Um, the kinds of numbers, $100 a ton, $125 a ton. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, as I said, there's an important research question, which I can't talk about, which is the optimal time profile, where you balance off uh, the uh, various aspects of cost adjustment with the benefits of a high price instigating uh, more induced innovation uh, uh, today. Next slide. Uh, so the important thing I wanted to emphasize is what we call it our climate policy packages and uh, including all of the things uh, uh, that I listed before designed to induce learning and respond to new information and take into account non-climate benefits that I emphasized in the beginning of the talk. Um, and finally, uh, one of the reasons why one can't rely on prices alone is that there will have to be large systemic changes in the major economic systems uh, comprising the economy. And prices are good for inducing marginal changes, but often do not work so well in response to uh, systemic changes. Uh, next slide. Um, let me skip that so I go on. Uh, so uh, we, we argued that there are many low-cost complementary policies uh, uh, such as investments in low-cost carbon uh, infrastructure, uh, urban planning, um, uh, land and forest management, important, particularly important, important is fostering R&D, uh, uh, a lot of discussion of uh, uh, financial uh, interve interventions in the financial markets, uh, some very e negative cost things, reducing uh, fossil fuel subsidies and um, uh, encouraging shadow pricing in both uh, private and the public sector. Next slide. Uh, there are also many examples of regulatory uh, interventions. One of the important things that I want to emphasize is that many of these uh, are easy to enforce. There, there is uh, sometimes a mantra saying that regulations are expensive, stifling. They're actually uh, uh, much uh, 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 easier to implement often than uh, price, uh, interven price interventions. Next slide. One of the things that uh, we stress is that um, when asked to under, uh, I, I talked earlier about market failures. Uh, I talk, uh, we, we uh, in a world in which uh, we have market failures, uh, governments inevitably have all kinds of rules to deal with them and uh, the rules of the economic game matter uh, and uh, they matter in ways that affect uh, climate uh, importantly. So here the idea is very simple, markets don't exist in a vacuum um, and uh, there are many rules that affect climate change and there are two that are now being uh, subject to a lot of discussion and exemplify how we could actually get a more efficient economy at the same time that we reduce carbon emissions significantly. Uh, those two are at the bottom of the slide. One of them is uh, disclosure rules uh, concerning climate risk. Uh, the market doesn't on its own won't have the incentive to disclose. People don't really understand the nature, the magnitudes of climate risk. Uh, there's a empir some empirical evidence on that. Um, and uh, better information would allow the market to assess climate risk uh, better. And that almost surely would lead to uh, a, a more avoidance of uh, activities that are associated with high climate risk. And the second thing is uh, the rules that we have for fiduciaries, uh, that uh, these rules, at least in some jurisdictions like the United States, in the past have precluded 
those fiduciaries from taking into account uh, uh, climate and environmental and other ESG effects. And uh, we ought to change that because those are an important aspect of uh, affecting the way the economic system and uh, so being. So, um, uh, uh, there, next slide. So there are uh, a whole set of uh, 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 policy agenda now being discussed that would move us more in the direction actually to better climate and greater efficiency. Well, um, next slide. Next slide. Um, economists have a strong pre predilection for the use of prices uh, and very rightly concerned about uh, deviating from a single price system. Uh, but uh, most countries have deviated from relying on a single price uh, by subsidizing, for instance, renewable uh, renewals or regulations. And how do we explain this? And that was really the thrust of the paper uh, I mentioned before in the European Economic Review, where I show that uh, in the uh, uh, presence of market failures and in the presence of costly redistribution, uh, those generate shadow prices and it is accordingly optimal to, uh, it may be optimal to have uh, uh, not rely on a single price of carbon uh, because we want to uh, reduce the redistributive burden and we want to at the same time correct uh, other market failures. Next slide. Uh, next slide after that. So let me just conclude with a few broad remarks. Uh, the world is engaged in a risky experiment. Uh, we, uh, science has provided us with an increasingly clear and bleak view of what will happen if we don't change business as usual. Uh, there, it is imperative that there be a reduction in emission levels. We are absorbing uh, far more energy than we are emitting on earth. Uh, some recent data that came in uh, suggested that that, that absorption uh, is really increased uh, significantly in recent years. Um, obviously, it's imperative that we reduce these emissions efficiently and where the burden of adjustment is equitably shared. And that requires a new economic model, change patterns of consumption and innovation. Uh, we've treated two scarce goods as if they were free. And uh, char changing, charging for them will lead to large changes in prices. Um, and uh, the, we aren't fully uh, sure of exactly that. And that's one of the sources of risk that I haven't had uh, time to fully address. Next slide. But uh, no, uh, go back a second. Uh, oh, yeah, next slide. I'm sorry. Um, the. Uh, I also want to emphasize that global warming is a long run problem, but it's a problem which needs to be attacked now. Um, and uh, delay will increase the cost. It's less expensive to not add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere than to remove them once there. Uh, and uh, next slide. But the good news is that on the basis of all the evidence is that the cost of responding to climate change, if we do it efficiently, is relatively small and much smaller than the cost of not responding. But of course, certain sectors and firms will be hurt. There's going to be distributive consequences and uh, th there'll be some uh, new industries that'll be created. Uh, and so we have to, as part of our climate packages, take into account those distributive effects and uh, help those who are adversely affected. Next slide. There's need for global cooperation and enforcement. And here, the most important idea is, I think it will probably be necessary to have a uh, cross-border tax 
to induce countries to uh, cooperate uh, in uh, and avoid uh, dumping. Final slide. So uh, I hope this uh, brief lecture, as all of you know, that uh, climate change poses a rich and uh, uh, an essential uh, research agenda. And what I've tried to do is focus on just one aspect of that research agenda uh, around uh, a model that has been very central to economists' analysis of what to, how to respond, the integrated assessment models, trying to explain the many flaws in the standard models, uh, hopefully uh, 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 elicit more work to develop better models and uh, highlighting at the same time, uh, as we get better models, uh, we'll get better policies to respond to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Stiglitz. Excellent lecture, thank you so much. So if you like, uh, we have a lot of questions in our chat and the Q&A box, and we can address some of them, like the ones that have higher marks. So we have 15 <laughs> votes, <laughs> uh, uh, very democratic. <laughs> Nico Yacola, who is asking the following. So given the long round nature of the problem and the inability of the government to commit to future policies, should we instead focus on policies which make the future politics of carbon pricing easier? Oh, that's a good question, as your vote uh, suggested. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, and that was actually part of the the uh, strategy of Paris, very explicitly. Um, the idea was that if we could convince enough firms that there was a, enough of a commitment to dealing with uh, carbon, then firms would make the investments. And once the firms made the investments, they would have an incentive to make sure those investments paid off by making sure that there's a price of carbon or making sure that there's regulations on carbon so that we would make the green transition. So part of the whole strategy of Paris was a political economy strategy. And of course, many people were disappointed and they said, we didn't go all the way. But actually, for the many, some of the people who were very much at, at, in the point of organizing it, they said, you know, our objective is to get us enough along the way where the momentum will be so much people invested in it that they will push it the rest of the way. Um, that's also why at the end of my talk, I emphasize cross-border taxes. Yes, uh, the presence of, if, if we could get a global agreement or at least a, a agreement from uh, a large number of, you might call coalition the willing, <laughs> and uh, countries that didn't want to play uh, would face a hard choice. If we continue producing steel in a dirty way, we can't export it. Or if we do export it, we pay taxes and the foreign government is going to get the revenue from those taxes. So there's a carbon tax, but with the revenue going to the other government. And that changes domestically the uh, incentives for uh, a global agreement and incentives for having uh, uh, adequate uh, regulations and, and pricing of carbon. So um, thinking through how you generate that political economy is, is, is not easy. I uh, agree. <laughs> and, uh, Remarkably, I think um, without uh, highlighting it, I think we are actually been very successful because uh, younger people really have come to understand the importance of climate change. And they are the political force that is going to be driving the world going forward. And that education, I don't know how we did it, but that education to make people aware of climate change has changed people's attitudes, voters' attitudes, and uh, it's having a very big impact, uh, even in the United States, 
And so I view that as part of the political uh, strategy. And then let me make just a, a fourth comment, just very briefly, which is, um, while the disclosure requirements that are being discussed in the United States of carbon risk are very important just as a matter of capital market efficiency. Uh, the fact that you're reminding people about that risk changes the, 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 the salience of that risk in their mind yeah. and helps make change the political economy of, of, of climate. So some of the policies, uh, as we think about them, yes, they are, they can be evaluated as straight, narrow, conventional economic terms, but they also change our perceptions of, uh, in an important way. And I think we ought to be more conscious of how different policies help shape our perceptions. That's true. I fully agree with that. And talking about perceptions, there are a lot of questions in the chat about the usefulness of cost benefit analysis in this regard. So the question we have posed by Benjamin Blantz is the following. A lot of critiques of CBA in the context of climate IAMs appear to apply to CBA more generally. What are the implications for the application of CBA in general in terms of climate change, I suppose? Well, I, uh, I think the, 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 the point that was being made is that quite often uh, we are have a great deal of difficulty assessing all the elements of one side or the other, say uh, uh, the benefits. Um, for instance, um, one example where uh, we did not use cost benefit analysis uh, at all was uh, when we went to war in World War II. Yeah. Nobody said, uh, uh, President Roosevelt in the United States didn't say on Pearl Harbor Day, well, I'm gonna have to, uh, before I respond to uh, attack from Japan, uh, my economic team has to do the cost and benefit analysis uh, and calculate the probabilities of winning and losing, and then we'll do uh, uh, a decision. That's not how that's not how people do that. Yeah. But um, uh, I wrote a book uh, called "The Three Trillion Dollar War" uh, uh -huh. about the Iraq War, yeah. uh, Iraq and Afghanistan War, and um, what I argued there was we ought to know what the costs are. Absolutely. Yeah. And we ought to know what various dimensions of the things that are hard to monetize. Yeah. So the number of people who are dying, uh, injured, yeah. uh, what it's doing to dislocation of people, civilization, all that. We may not be able to add them all up that's true. But having knowing that the war was going to cost us three trillion, I actually thought it was going to be five trillion, but but five trillion sounded too much, and I wanted to convince people not to do something. So the three trillion dollar war, it was uh, it made people aware there's a high cost, and then they said, well, are the benefits justified? No matter how you assess them. You didn't have to put it in a single equation. Well, one of the things that we're talking about here in climate change is what I emphasized is that uh, we know we can achieve with a high probability one and a half to two degrees with reasonably low cost. Exactly. It's yeah. not zero, but it's not a very high cost. No greater than the kind of perturbation in energy prices that we've had in the past, like when uh, we uh, the spikes in the 1970s. But at the same time, we know 
that there is enormous risk of allowing climate change to go beyond one and a half to two degrees. So it's very much like that. that that's why I think the world has done the right judgment. They say the costs are limited. The risk of not doing anything are unacceptable. And we don't have to fine tune our analysis. The world is, that's not the way the world works. You, you, we, what we want to do is, should we target going to net no, zero neutrality um, to avoid the worst risks that we might face? Answer is unambiguously yes. And that's why I think the IAM models were so badly flawed. That is what I call the criticism of the normative framework. Agree. Let me go through the chat because we have a lot of questions now. <laughs> getting toward the end, uh, people are getting excited. So one question we have highly voted as well by Christian Golier, and I will collect another one from CBA afterwards, uh, from CBA related to norms, social norms and so on. But Christian is asking related to what you are mentioning, why did the US economies try to change the 7% discount rate that prevailed in the US over the last 25 years? What were the motivating reasons for not changing the 7%? Well, why they not changed it? Why the why didn't U.S. economies try to change the seven percent discount rate that prevailed in the U.S. Well, over the last twenty five years? Well, I have been trying to. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> when I was chair, that was one of my main campaigns to get it uh, down, and and we actually uh, uh, succeeded in in getting some sentences that say that we ought to be moving it down for long run uh, things like. Uh, climate change. Um, I think uh, the um, uh, re the part of the reason is that um, the they haven't really understood the difference. the The representative Asia model that I talked about is very deeply ingrained in macroeconomics, in optimal growth theory. And people just assume that the economy is described by that model and therefore the interest rates reflect the marginal rates of substitution. And then they make the mistake of thinking of, of not dealing with risk. And so the safe rate of interest in the United States right now is negative. <laughs> the safe rate of interest over the long run has been like 1%, 1.5%. Firms require compensation for bearing risk, and that's why the return on capital is greater than zero. But the investments in, in, in climate are like an insurance policy, and so the, at the margin ought to get a return uh, we ought to be looking at a lower rate than that. So I think it's it's that economists have not adequately dealt with risk in their model, have been too ingrained, both in macroeconomics and other areas, with this representative agent model, and haven't thought through a lot of the assumptions that go into that model, which is why Nick and I wrote the paper, because we thought uh, it, maybe if we wrote the paper, clarifying the hidden assumptions, people would say, yeah, that was a very, you know, it was clear that the conclusions of that model are wrong. And the question is, how do you explain to people why those conclusions are wrong? Where, where do they make the mistake? I agree fully. We have a lot of questions now, <laughs> as I was saying. So now we have different kind of uh, general questions. One of them is uh, about models and CBA. Uh, just to relate to that, and then we will have a few questions about the profession and, and advice you may give to junior researchers in this area or uh, faculty starting in this area. So, related question, what is, uh, what is the ethical uh, uh, criterion for ex exempting issues from CBAs? For example, we don't do CBAs from ending modern slavery. Does action on climate change share, share the same moral standing? Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, there are moral values get 
integrated in a very obvious way when you have intergenerational distribution where you're discounting future generations. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I value myself more than my children or my grandchildren, and by a lot. Mm -hmm. So that's a moral. And, and so in our models, we ought to think very carefully that that's, that's a, uh, when we have a social welfare function, we have inevitably an ethical judgment. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I also emphasize intra-generational distribution as well that uh, we don't, if, if uh, those who suffer the most from climate change are in developing countries, mm -hmm. uh, in the tropics, and their income is very low, it's an ethical question. We ought to weigh that more heavily in our decision-making. Mm -hmm. Now, it would, it's absurd to say from a global social welfare point of view that we've optimally redistributed. Uh, in any ethical social welfare function, we would be giving more redistribution. Absolutely. Uh, we, we, how, how we justify why we aren't is another matter, but clearly I don't think there's anybody that would defend using a global social welfare function that weighed the poor very low because they're poor we should weigh them more uh, because the marginal social utility is high so those are examples of how in the framework we can easily and ought to incorporate ethics and we have not been mm -hmm. but the, in a more general cost benefit analysis clearly we put constraints on um you know, uh, uh, in many, many of the problems that we, we deal with, uh, slavery is one example um, uh, that we value as an ethical uh, individual's ability to make their own decisions about certain areas as long as they don't do harm to others. And uh, 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 slavery is... Uh, <laughs> anyway... So, so we have to put that into our model, to our thinking about, about these right. decisions. Thank you. Thank so you. just two so questions question. and then we conclude. Uh, we have seen over the pandemic that uh, global cooperation is really difficult, even in the most desperate situations. So how we can, as economists, push toward or maximize this probability of global cooperation to fight climate change? What advice can you give us? Well, I... I I talked about one thing, which is the the um, instrument of uh, cross border taxes. To uh, and that's part of a broader notion of trying to form. Some people talk about a, um, club clubs uh, uh, coalitions of the willing, uh, and seeing how much uh, one can do and how large of a coalition. Of, of, of the willing uh, is going to be. Um, I think that the advanced countries need to recognize that the cost to developing countries is much larger and not approach it just as a bargaining problem where how much can I force them to pay or, you know, but more of a, uh, yes, it's a bargaining, but it's also an, a moral and ethical issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very disturbed at the G7 meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago that uh, it seems so difficult for the advanced countries to live up to the commitment of giving a hundred billion dollars to a year to the developing countries and emerging markets to help them make the green transition. It's in our interest. And, um, you know, I think they're $20 billion short, 20 billion in a global economy, you know, where the advanced countries GDP is something like $40 trillion. 
you, you, you might laugh about uh, how could that be a problem? Um, you know, it's in our self-interest to get everybody on board. And it's a moral obligation for us to help the less. Uh, so I think um, if we had uh, uh, political leadership, and this goes back to one of the your first question, the political economy where we recognize everywhere that this is a global problem and where we recognize that there are differences in ability to pay and that uh, just like within our country, we don't expect people who are very poor to contribute and we help them, we give them money. Um, so do globally. And uh, this is an area where it is so much in our self-interest to buy cooperation, to get climate change, that uh, I think uh, that is going, uh, uh, is a part. And I think the mindset is changing in many of the developing countries, merging markets, particularly where they're choking with pollution. I think that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we've, they've recognized the dangers more vividly. And in the, uh, he spells, uh, the, so I think the world is moving in that direction. And with some uh, acts of generosity, I think we could uh, move it a little bit more. Great. And yes, to start concluding, what do you think about uh, international uh, differentiation on social uh, damages of carbon? So implying that to have different uh, carbon uh, social uh, damages uh, represented with different uh, pricing strategies. Uh, Caroline Fisher is asking, in trying to promote better internalization of the social damages of carbon, which are global, to what extent should carbon prices still be differentiated across countries to respect CBDRs? Yeah, so uh, this is one of the things we actually addressed in, in the uh, Stirring Stiglitz Commission. And um, just like I argued in very briefly in my talk, in my paper, European Economic Review paper, I argued that within a country, there's not a single carbon price because you have too many constraints and uh, you, you may want to uh, use one carbon price associated with encouraging innovation and another carbon price associated somewhere else. There, yes, it interferes with efficiency, but there are other things you care about, like distribution, that when you look at the second, third, fourth best nature of the economic system, it's optimal to do that. That same principle holds across countries. So if we were in a first best world, yet you would say, yes, a single price of carbon, all uses everywhere. And I wrote, a, at one time, I, I actually argued that position, but then I started thinking about all these constraints and came to the view that you actually need a, a more subtle uh, system. Great. So just to conclude, if you were starting the profession, uh, what advice would you give to new incomers? Uh, how, do she, how they should focus their research? Do you think we should get rid of IMS? IAMS, or should we think of different type of modeling techniques or how we should address the climate problem? So, um, I, in general, let me first, uh, and I think it, it, it's important uh, that one focus on important problems. <laughs> and uh, if you're going to devote your intellectual energies, uh, economics is not just a game, there are other things you, you could enjoy as mathematics uh, that are, uh, uh, but it's a, it, it, it has important consequences. So uh, think about doing things where the answer makes a difference, um, where it, it uh, addresses uh, one of the key problems our society faces. And there are many, the climate, the inequality, we still have economic fluctuations, so, um, and this illustrates in another context, uh, a distinction. A lot of the macroeconomic models 
focus on assessing how well the models do in um, modeling small perturbations in the economy. The consequences of small perturbations are small. <laughs> the, the things we really care about are things like the Euro crisis, the 2008 crisis, the pandemic, and our models, the standard macro models, do very badly for deep downturns. I want to encourage your macro, my students, to think about deep downturns, not the little, little variations from 3.1 to 3.15 in the growth rate. It's from minus two to plus five. That, that is really the big thing, and especially the negatives are the the crises. Uh, so that I would say is, uh, and 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 among the big problems, as I say, is uh, the environment and, and climate. Uh, climate is not the only one. We're going to be having water. Um, there are many environmental problems that we will be uh, toxic waste. Uh, there. Um, I think the the uh, implication of my talk was that um, it is a very natural thing in any discipline to borrow tools that are already developed as you make the next step, step in your research. So 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it was a very natural thing for the IAM to borrow the Ramsey model, the representative Asia model, to begin the work in integrating economics and the environment. But that was 25 years ago. That's no justification for those models to have any currency today. That, uh, that it should have become clear that there are so many assumptions that go into those models that make them useless, basically, for analyzing the key problem of what we should do about climate change. <laughs> and uh, therefore, you know, to try to think through what are the key ingredients, which are risk, distribution. Um, one of the things, I mean, just uh, one of the things that, as I was writing this, thinking about how many really interesting problems that there are still to be done in climate change, even though it's been around for a long time. So for instance, I talked about the normative frame. How do you think about decision-making where you have deep uncertainty? Um, how do we get a normative framework to deal with that? Uh, how do we uh, have a, a normative frameworks to deal with fat tail distributions? Uh, uh, or when we don't discount uh, future generations? Um, how do we embed more uh, market failures, uh, second best, third best economics? So it's actually, uh, I, I, the last slide I, I was trying to highlight, uh, this is a very rich area, um, but uh, one has to depart from the easy models uh, that are not appropriate for analyzing this very important problem and to get something that is uh, uh, more relevant to, to the kind of market uh, uh, assessment, assessing in, in the kind of economy that we actually have. We, we thank you so much for your words and for your encouragement. We are really thankful for this excellent lecture, Professor Stiglitz. Uh, we would love to keep talking to you, but uh, we are running out of time. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you for, for all your time and all your interesting thoughts. They were fascinating. And if, if you could maybe uh, stay around just for a few seconds just, uh, we, while we are closing the session, but we thank you very, very much. And uh, we see each other in the, in the near future, hopefully. And our colleagues may now attend uh, the rest of the sessions. And I wish them all a very nice uh, conference and uh, a very successful uh, meeting.